Hello and welcome to this screencast on vertebrate diversity and evolution part two. So in this part we will talk about reptiles, birds, and mammals and adaptations that they have for their environment because remember we're really focused on the environment and the transition from water to land. So we just finished talking about fish and amphibians and how they needed adaptations for water and now we're moving on to the land. So let's start with reptiles, just a basic definition. Any vertebrate that has a dry, scaly skin, lungs, and then the real big key here is the amniotic egg. This is really allowing vertebrates to move onto land. So we're gonna focus on that a little later. Um, so all of these together live, help uh, reptiles to live entirely out of water. Um, so evolution of reptiles, they were the first to live um, out of water, so they don't need water for reproduction either. Um, they have well-developed lungs so that they can breathe air on land. They have a double-loop circulatory system. Remember talking about in class how this is more efficient because it goes back to the heart uh, before it pumps to the body. A water-conserving excretory system. So this is really important because if they're not relying on water, they don't want to put out a lot of water in their urine. So they want to have a very concentrated urine so they're not wasting water strong limbs to um, help them on land, internal fertilization, this is the first time we see internal fertilization in vertebrates, and lastly, a shelled terrestrial egg that does not rely on water. And so there's an example of that amniotic egg and dry scaly skin. Uh, body temperature control. Remember with fish and amphibians, they were ectotherms? Well, we are still ectothermic. So they rely on their environment and behavior to control their body temperature. And here's a picture of some turtles basking in the sun to warm themselves. Uh, to cool down, they would move to a shade or shelter or burrow underground uh, to get cool. So in the middle here, we have our reptile heart. It's still uh, three chambers like the amphibian was, um, but we have a little bit more um, with the reptile. We have a little bit more separation here. There is a little flap here that's going to protect the mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. But as you can see, we still have mixing in that one ventricle there for the reptile heart. So we're still not perfect, but we're getting there. Uh, reproduction, re reproduction, we call reptiles oviparous, meaning they lay eggs that develop outside the mother's body, but they are fertilized internally within the, uh, the mother's body. Um, all reptiles produce with internal fertilization, um, but they do lay eggs that develop outside. So I keep talking about this amniotic egg. This is the real adaptation that allows vertebrates to live totally outside of water. The shell and the membrane protect the embryo from drying out. Um, and it has four membranes, the amnion, the yolk sac, the chorion, and the allantois. Um, here's a picture of it. I'm not going to expect you to know. I'm not even going to tell you what, what, what all this is or what the purpose is. Um, but basically, the real important part is this yolk sac. That's going to provide the food and the nutrition for that growing embryo. And the amnion is really going to protect it from drying out on land. Groups of reptiles, four surviving groups, lizards and snakes. Uh, crocodiles, which also include alligators, um, and finally we have uh, tortoises and turtles as well. And the last one is our tuatara. The tuatara is uh, really only found in New Zealand and um, in New Guinea. Okay, now we move on to birds. Birds are reptile-like animals, um, and we say they're reptile-like um, a lot of because of their legs. They have uh, reptile-like legs, don't they? We finally now have um, a vertebrate that can control the internal body temperature, so we call them endotherms. So they are responsible for their own body temperature through metabolism. Birds are also unique, obviously, in that they have feathers, um, and they have front limbs that are modified into wings. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about bird evolution. Paleontologists generally agree that birds did, in fact, evolve from extinct reptiles um, because birds also have this amniotic egg that I was talking about earlier. They also have um, similar nitrogenous waste called uric acid. So remember, this is a concentrated urine so that they're not wasting water because they don't live in water anymore. They're on land. Um, and they also have um, bones that are going to support against gravity, so limbs, um, and the bones are actually similar in reptiles and birds. So for all these reasons, we think that birds evolved from reptiles. And there's a, an example of amniotic egg of a bird. 
Um, Archaeopteryx is an important fossil. It was the very first bird-like fossil found. Um, it looked like a dinosaur, but it had feathers. So we think that Archaeopteryx is sort of this transition between dinosaurs and birds. It had teeth in its beak, a bony tail, to, uh, toes and claws on its wings. Um, so it might be that transitional fossil. And here's an example of this fossil that was discovered called Archaeopteryx. Very interesting. Okay, adaptations for flight. So highly efficient digestive, respiratory, and circulatory system. They're wasting a lot of energy flying. Well, not really wasting, but using a lot of energy flying. So they don't want to um, expend any more energy than they need to digesting and breathing and pumping their blood. Um, aerodynamic feathers and wings. Strong, lightweight bones is very important for them to be in the air for so long. So here's an example of the inside of bird bones. You can think of it as sort of like corrugated cardboard, like a moving box. That's how uh, not dense it is, how lightweight and hollow uh, those bird bones are. Um, like we said earlier, they're endotherm, so they have a high rate of metabolism, which produces heat for themselves, and their feathers also uh, conserve energy for them and keep them warm. And our last vertebrate group is mammals. Mammals um, are different from any other vertebrate group for two main reasons. They have hair and mammary glands. So those are two important characteristics to keep in mind. Um, and in females, these mammary glands produce milk to nourish uh, young. So adaptations for specific and differentiated ways of life on land for mammals. Again, lungs, the four-chambered heart. Um, they are endotherms like birds are. And they have limbs and digits uh, that are going to be adapted to their particular uh, way of life. And so this is an example of a human hand and why we need these five digits uh, for our way of life. Also really important is differentiated teeth for a variety of food. And we also have uh, st stronger, more powerful jaw muscles uh, for chewing on different types of food. So these are all characteristics of mammals alone. So earlier I said that we've got this four-chambered heart. Birds also have a four-chambered heart. So birds and mammals share this. So you can see as we transition to a higher form of life, we need a more efficient cardiovascular system with four chambers. So we have, in fact, two ventricles now and two atria. And you can see that the deoxygenated blood in blue is totally separated from the oxygenated blood um, in red. So that's a really, really important adaptation for life on land. Better efficient pumping. Groups of mammals is our last little slide here. Monotremes, marsupials, and placentals. So monotremes are very, very unique in that they lay eggs. Yes, there is a group of mammals that lay eggs. Um, and they also share a couple characteristics with reptiles. They have a cloaca, remember that common opening for digestive, reproductive, and urinary systems. And they lay soft-shelled eggs that incubate outside of the body. Um, an example that you probably know of is the duckbill platypus that's only in Australia uh, and New Guinea. So that's the duck-billed platypus that lays eggs. Marsupials, the most common example is the kangaroo. Um, they bear live young, but then they actually finish development um, in an external pouch. And so that's called a little joey in the pouch there that's going to finish developing in there. And lastly, our placentals. Uh, humans are placentals. They um, are named for the structure that develops um, in the womb, which sort of connects the embryonic tissue with the mother's body, and that's how the embryo gets its oxygen and its nutrition. And so these are just examples of placentals. And that does it for vertebrate diversity, part two.